good evening. I had to start the video or else Steve would be serenading us all with Rolling Stone songs. There's no point in stopping before the video starts. It's like you push the little button and you've got what, like two or three second countdown. Yeah. But you want me to be quiet before you push the button, but I'm not willing to be quiet until the button's been pushed. Yeah. So, so we hope you guys have been singing your way through this day. We had a wonderful day. It is really the, the temperature where we live. It's been really breezy. And so we were in the sun a lot today, but I didn't ever get hot. And so I looked at my skin. I was like, oh my goodness, we got quite a bit of color today. So that was awesome. We hope you are doing great. Ready for, what is it, Thursday night? This is Thursday, Thursday night. Thursday night, yeah. Ready for a great weekend. But we are answering a question tonight that came up in the Germany Medicine self-healing support group if you are not in there that is a great place to come and get support uh, get your questions if you have any questions gnm questions answered um so i'm going to share it in that group really quick and then we'll read the question okay so the question is if you are at peace with your world and your past is it really necessary to understand the conflict shock specifics that are causing health issues so just a little background for those of you who might be brand new to German New Medicine. The whole paradigm is based off the understanding that physical symptoms, if you have a tumor, if you have a diagnosis, if you have ongoing chronic health issues, those things are not an error that your body is making. They're not a mistake. They're not a problem. They are an adaptive response. So what happens during the conflict when you are in conflict active mode, your tissues make certain adaptations, certain modifications to their function to allow you to get out of the conflict situation. Then once you resolve the conflict, you move into a restoration phase or the healing phase. And this is where your body tissues are repaired, rebuilt. If there was a tumor that was built up during the conflict phase, that tumor is deconstructed using bacteria. So there's a whole host of symptoms that come along with the healing process. Now the person's question is, if you're at peace, if you feel pretty much at peace with your world, at peace with the stuff that happened to you, is it really necessary to understand the conflict shock specific? So what exactly happened, the moment in time where you were caught off guard and kind of all of the things that go along with that? And it's not a yes or no answer to this question. It's kind of, we have to look at the individual. And that's the biggest thing about GNM is it all has to do with the individual, with their state of mind, with their understanding level, because if I if I just said, oh no, it's not important for you to understand the conflict shock specifics, that person, if they're not aware of kind of all of the nuances of conflict of their own experience, then they might actually be prone to having that same conflict again. And that's something we want to prevent. Or if I just said, oh yes, you need to dig into all the specifics, they might be at a place emotionally where digging into it actually kind of reactivates for them some deep-seated stuff and they kind of are reliving the conflict and they reactivate, they go back into conflict active mode. And so that's why you can't really give just a yes or no kind of blanket answer to this. You have to look at the individual. You have to ask more questions about what is your understanding level currently of your own experience of the German New Medicine principles of you know your conflict, the symptoms that you're having. There's just a lot of, that goes into it. And so we'll cover some of those different nuances tonight in covering the question. And then obviously that individual, um, for you, you'll have to see, you know, is there something more here for me? Is there more that I need to learn about GNM in general, that conflict in specific, or myself? And that's always the biggest thing is understanding yourself and your own experience. Yeah, so the, my kind of approach to this would be rather than um, telling you one way or the other, no, you have to you have to dig in or oh, no it's not necessary I, I, I would prefer to do is kind of explore all the different things you know what i'm saying like let's let, let's look at them each and um and, and and let's sort of like talk about what would be true if it is necessary you know what would be true if it's not necessary what would it mean for it to be necessary so on and so forth um and i i'm going to go through here i pay a lot of attention just to, to the words because it's interesting to me and it really triggers a lot of stuff and so let's kind of go through the actual kind of verbatim of what the question was it was a great question and and let's kind of operationally define some things Let, let's make it let's make sure what you mean by the words that you've used and what i'm kind of hearing or what i think these words mean let's make sure that there's kind of um 
a parallel going on there, a tracking going on. Let's make sure we're lined up so that when I say yes or no, um, in my view, you'll know kind of what I'm responding to. Because sometimes I'll be responding to uh, meanings that aren't there for you. You know, like, like there'll be certain words will have a certain meaning for me that maybe they don't have for you, or maybe they have a certain meaning for you that they don't have for me. And that's what we end up kind of talking past each other and stuff like that. And so in, in an effort to kind of facilitate complete, real, practical understanding versus, well, the GNM says this and kerplunk, there you go. Um, let's try to actually get somewhere. So one thing is um, if you're at peace with uh, the world and your past, it's really important that we figure out what at peace means because that for, for different people it might mean different things. And the, the ones that came up for me was... Um, basically two different things that being at peace could mean for a person that occurred to me right off. The first thing is you've actually changed what your experience of whatever the situation is. You've actually changed your experience of it. So you were uh, traumatized in some way and there's a certain experience that comes along with that. There are certain patterns of believing, there's certain patterns of focusing, there's certain patterns of feeling, perhaps certain patterns of behavior. There's this whole kind of like thing, right, that goes along with that. It's possible to unravel that experience. It's possible to deconstruct, to dissect that experience, to literally take it apart so that your current experience of your personal history is completely different than it used to be. That's one thing that being at peace could be. I could be at peace with something because I've so thoroughly changed my experience of it for the better that it actually just doesn't bother me anymore. That's one. The other thing that being at peace could mean to a person, and I think this is more kind of... Uh, the common or the more uh, common thing that people would feel about that is they're getting psychologically used to a really unpleasant experience. Mm -hmm. This is the person who is coping, you know, and, and like coping implies that you're coping with something. There's an experience that's unpleasant, but you've gotten really good at dealing with it. Do you know what I'm saying? And you've, you've toughened up. And I mean, that's, that's, it's understandable and it's impressive to me that human beings have the ability to cope with the things that they can and there's, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, there is some question about whether and to what extent it's serving you and there's some question about, you know, that one of the big things for me in working with people is that just because someone is able to do something doesn't mean that doing that uh, serves them and it doesn't mean that it's the best thing for them to be doing and, and best is very, was really much better than good, you know what I'm saying? And so if you are capable of, of kind of coping with your current experience of all the stuff that went on. And a lot of people never consider the possibility that they can literally engineer a new experience of the same event or the same situation. And so they never, never really um, put their mind to work on that project because they've never heard of doing it. And, and in so doing, it's possible to overlook a lot of what you're capable of doing. A lot of, of, a, a lot of the times we kind of, in our experience, we create a mountain and then we scale that mountain, we climb over that mountain. Do you know what I'm saying? We then surmount that situation. Sometimes it's actually possible to sort of move that mountain. It's, it's actually possible to, I mean, what is it? The faith of the mustard seed, you know what I'm saying? And you tell the mountain to get out of the way and it does. Experientially, that is a possibility. Um, a lot of people don't know about that, right? And so it really depends on what at peace means. Does at peace mean that you've kind of toughened up to the point that you can cope with an unpleasant experience? Or does it mean you fundamentally transmuted that experience, right? So that it almost seems like it happened to a different person. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like the you that that happened to isn't around anymore. And, and you, you know it kind of factually. Like there's a lot of stuff that's happened to me in my life that I, I know um, kind of uh, historically biographically these things happen but the feeling is not it doesn't belong to me anymore it, it's not mine you know what I'm saying I'm actually fundamentally a different person now so that's one thing that's really relevant there um, let's see then they said is it really necessary to understand the conflict shock specifics that are causing health issues and one thing there again about the word the words here and this is not, I'm not being a, a stickler here it's just a, you know let me just look at this and say it specifically um, Strictly speaking, if the conflict is in fact causing health issues, then by definition, at least at a biological level, the conflict isn't resolved, right? So resolved conflicts don't cause physical health problems. Now, well, I mean, healing. Well, that, yeah. no, that's, that, that's a little different. So if you have resolved it, and strictly speaking, the pain of the healing phase isn't really a health problem. That's a process of kind of like moving from mm. the adapted phase to kind of like the, the new, you know, like everything's fine now. Um, so that's one thing. If the conflict is causing 
a, a, a disease process or what's called a disease process, well, then it's obviously not resolved. One thing that I would watch out for, and this is pretty interesting, is that it's possible to have resolved something maybe psychologically without maybe resolving it biologically. And, and what that means kind of like what we talked about before, I've kind of gotten um, used to a certain experience. I've toughened myself up so that I can deal with that experience. Your body though is still responding to it. Like your body is, if you're experiencing yourself as a victim or if you're experiencing yourself as in danger or you're experiencing yourself in some way that's not uh, pleasant for you, your body will be responding to that and it will be attempting to adapt itself to what that experience suggests about your environment, right? It'll be attempting to adapt itself to that. And one thing that I put in here is um, res resolution versus non-resistance. You know, resistance is something that we talk about a lot, something I talk about a lot, and it's it's like when I'm emotionally opposed to the fact that something or some person or some situation is as it or they are at a given moment in time. I'm kind of like, ah, about it. I'm, I have not accepted it. I'm resisting it. That's kind of a psychological, spiritual thing. It's possible for me to be not resisting something, let's say not resisting a conflict or the situation or the, whatever that's kind of related to it without having resolved it. You know, and now if I'm not resisting it, I won't be suffering over it in that kind of like existentially way. But it's possible that the conflict is still active and causing me problems, say at a biological level, causing those physical adaptations. And so, it, it, you know, it, we want to kind of like get the mind and the body together. And sometimes the body, I mean, there, there is an overlap in those priorities. So you get the body over here and the mind's over here. It's like a Venn diagram. There are things that both kind of are concerned about. And there are also things that only the mind's concerned about and only the, only the body is concerned about. And to the degree that we can become aware of the things that the body uh, may be concerned about, we can kind of address things on that level. We can kind of resolve them at a really deep level. Because it's, it's, it's unfortunate if like I come to psychological terms with something that happened to me, but maybe my body hasn't quite come mm -hmm. around. It's like, you've done all the work. You've done a lot of really great work, but somehow or another the body hasn't gotten the message, and now it's causing you all sorts of inconvenience. It's causing you physical you know, issues. It's creating perhaps a, a difficult healing phase for you in the future. So it's great if we can kind of translate that really good work you've done psychologically in, in terms of coping. If you can cope with something, you can resolve it. Resolving things is always so much easier than coping with them. So if you can do what you've done, you can do kind of what GNM is, is suggesting that you do. Um, and it doesn't have to involve like the, you know, like 15 years of psychotherapy. It's not that kind of a thing. So. Yeah. I think that if you're not in an emotionally, psychologically fragile place, that the more understanding you can gather, the better. I'm just a huge fan of understanding. I'm a huge fan of learning, you know, so is it really necessary to understand the conflict shock? I think if you are interested in your own experience, if you're interested in the language of the body, if you're interested in preventing this type of conflict from happening again in the future, or just gathering all of the information that you will get by, by studying, I don't think there's any harm in studying unless, like I said, you're really emotionally fragile and you think that even touching that topic will kind of like cause you to crumble. I think that the more you learn, the better. I think that, you know, being at peace with your world and your past is awesome. And I would say that now, let me learn about my body. Let me learn about what are the things that can cause my body to adapt my tissues in ways that I didn't know before. Because that's the thing is before all of this, I had no idea that feeling bad about myself or, you know, beating myself up or, you know, wishing I knew the answer to something, intellectually beating myself up, that that was tied to neck pain. I had no idea. I had no idea that a relationship problem, um, fighting, feeling like I let somebody down would cause me shoulder pain. I just didn't know. And so now that I know that, now that I know the conflict shock specifics, I can modulate, I can monitor, I can keep track of what I'm experiencing mentally and emotionally and say, oh wait, I know that this feeling isn't just a feeling in my head. It's not just thoughts. It's a communication. Um, how does the body get the message, Debbie asks. The body gets the message based on your emotional experience. And so when you either are caught off guard by something that happens, you, you know, get a phone call, you find out that you're, you know, <laughs> you're so it's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so much more just like conflict. Hey, it's okay. It's fine. Here? Do you smell something we don't smell? This is like what he used to do when the bears were around, but bears don't live where we bears are now. Bears don't live in Big Bear. They live in Forest Falls. Yeah. He's got his, He's got his baton. Sorry, we're just... <laughs> 
Anyways, when you have a conflict shock, when you are caught off guard, or when you have reactivated something like a self-devaluation where you're like beating yourself up, that's how the body gets the message. The body gets the message based on your emotional, <laughs> yeah, Kim says Shmuel was caught off guard. Um, that's how your body, that's how you communicate with your body, moment to moment to moment. What is your experience? Remember, it's like your cells are just there waiting. They're waiting for messages from you about the safety of your environment. It's like, is everything good out there? Is everything, are you at peace? Are you relaxed? Is, you know, is it okay for us to kind of repair or do we need to be on high alert? Do we need to be adapting so that we can get you out of this shocking situation? And that's like, that is what your body is waiting around to listen for. What's your experience communicating to your tissues? Because every type of emotion that you have is, is sending one of two messages, safe or not safe. And so I think that when you really simplify it, when you really boil it down and you understand that, then you can kind of get into all of the nuances. Okay, what about this thought? Does this mm -hmm. thought send a message of like a thought like, do you guys hear that groaning? So funny. Like you're, you know, you got a little sun today. So this yeah. is a really interesting kind of, kind of minor conflict is getting too much sun. You feel like you got a sunburn. Um, something that changed for me, and I had a whole group of people who did that this summer. They got a little bit too much sun based on you know what they normally you know get when they're out or. You would start saying to yourself, "Oh my gosh, I got a sunburn. Oh my gosh, this is gonna hurt so bad tomorrow. Oh, I, you know, this is this is much worse than I thought." Oh, and you start dreading the pain. You start dreading the discomfort. You start getting really upset about it. What I found that that does that that uh, inner dialogue about the the sunburn or like the skin that's a little bit pink. What that does is causes a separation conflict. Where when I don't say that to myself, I can get super red, like like sunburnt red, like, oh, people say, oh my gosh, you got such a bad sunburn. And if I don't tell myself that, if I say, oh, it's gonna tan over really nicely tomorrow, it does not hurt. It is not swollen, it is not, you know, it's not inflamed. It is just, it's pink, but it's not painful. It's not like you can tell when there's like that swelling underneath the skin in addition to it. And I found that that's due to a separation conflict on top of having my son be a little bit pink from too much, to, from being in the sun for longer than I normally would have. Um, and so it's what I'm saying to myself that triggers the conflict, the communication that I'm sending to my nervous system is determining how my body is adapting. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that how does, how does it how does the body get the message? And just kind of like a kind of weird aside, but I think it, I think for me it, it's a helpful thing that there are these different levels of experience. So you could say that there's like a psychological experience that's like Debbie the person. You know what I'm saying? Not Debbie the animal or the organism, but Debbie the person who goes to certain work and talks to people and likes this and doesn't like that and so on and so forth. Or Steve, you know what I'm saying? He's a guy. He's not an animal, you know, particularly. Um, um, you know, so I mean, well, you know. Um, <laughs> And then but at the same time, there is a body there. And it, and it so happens that I am who I think I am in the sense that I am, in fact, a person. I am a guy who does, you know, person things. But there's also aspects of myself with which I'm not really identified. You know, I, it is so that I am an animal. It's so that I'm a biological organism. It, it's, you know, there are a lot of things about me that are true that I'm not necessarily identified with. And I think that's kind of like a whole lot of what, what's going on here is we become so intelligent and our mind has so, has, has we, there's an entire world up here that exists totally independent of the rest of the whole thing that it, it's like, you know, I'm not particularly identified with my big toe. I mean, unless I've just smashed it or something, but like, I don't really think of myself as my big toe. I, I think of myself as like a point of consciousness somewhere in here. The fact is though, I am as much the big toe as I am that point of consciousness or anything else. I mean, it's a it's it's one big thing. I mean, if, if something bad happens to this big toe, that part of me that I'm identified with that hides wherever is certainly affected by that. And a lot of what GNM is about, from my perspective, is learning to have consideration for those aspects of ourself that, that we don't normally identify with or that we aren't normally um, experiencing ourselves to be. I, I talk about like there's the me I experience myself to be, the ego, the I, the whatever, and then there's the whole whole of who I am, which includes that part, but also includes the rest of this body, this signal detection system. You know what I'm saying? The part that beats my heart 100,000 times a day, the part that digests my food, the sometimes the part that says, I'm not digesting this food, you're gonna barf this up. You know what I'm saying? All of those, those decisions, those are decisions that are being made by some aspect of, of, of this system 
that has to be me. It, it, certainly it's me. It's not anybody else. But I don't necessarily experience myself as being in charge of that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like learning to um, kind of like honor the group. Do you know what I'm saying? The, the, we are in some sense it's kind of a confederation of stuff. And kind of coming around to that, I think, and paying attention to that and saying, if I'm having a personal experience, you know, it's kind of like if you live in a family. If I'm really grumpy and angry and I'm not aware of the fact that my experience and the behaviors that I engage in as a result of that experience affect Melissa, I'll tend to behave in ways that don't serve me. I actually tend to behave in ways that create problems for me. Right? So I'll be a jerk to you or I'll be dismissive of you or I'll, you know, I'll maybe communicate to you that I'm mad at you or something like that when I'm actually not. I'm just preoccupied. And what does that do? It get you either get angry with me or you get sad and then I've got and then I feel bad about you being sad and I have the project of explaining to you what was going on and I've got the project of dealing with the negative emotions that were created as a response to that. Now instead of it being Melissa, imagine it's my body. So it's it's kind of like a family within a single organism where there's the me I experience myself to be in the whole whole of who I am. Mm -hmm. If you've ever walked into the house after kind of a rough day and allowed your experience to create in your environment from other people um, situations you don't want, you know exactly what this is like. You know, you got fired and you're just, you're just getting fired. You know what I'm saying? Psychologically, you're just really upset, not aware of the fact that your body's standing there, sort of like a child yeah. observing the whole thing. Um, how is this my fault? What did I do to cause this? What can I do to make this better? It's all this different stuff. It's like the child always finds out how to figure out how it's their fault. If the parents get divorced, if they have a fight or whatever, there's a sense in which the body always tries to figure out how it's its fault if the the psyche is having an unpleasant scenario because there's a from the biological perspective the psyche with the me i experience myself to be who's got all these desires and aspirations and concerns and preoccupations and preferences and all this different stuff is it is a communication that that the we we experience ourselves to be is very much an expression of uh, software that's designed to help this body interact with and respond and adapt to the environment in which the body's operating. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that, it's like, oh, we're, we're basically artificial intelligence in a sense, that this body grew this brain um, in order to help it interact with the environment. And part of the brain's features is that it has experience. You know, it's like if, if I had some artificial intelligence in my house, which maybe one day I will, I suspect that like the Alexas and all this different stuff, eventually it will have an experience that will assist it in doing what we want it to do. It'll feel good when it does it correctly and it'll feel bad when it gets the answer wrong. And that will be something that helps the artificial intelligence serve the people. And it is a sense in which we are artificial intelligence for our body. It's kind mm -hmm. of trippy. Um, but it's also kind of neat, you know what I'm saying? It kind of yeah. creates that shift and it's like, oh, you know, I am self-aware, you know what I'm saying? And, and it, it explains too, it kind of puts me in my place because I think, wait a minute, the body was here first. This organism was, was doing stuff before me came along, before I came along. And then it's just kind of like, you know, it makes it less of a, of a uh, impediment or kind of cumbersome. And it's more like, oh, let me, let me do my job here. Let me figure out how to not set off false positives, how to not tell my body something's wrong and actually there isn't anything wrong. Yeah, I think a big part of that is, you know, the point at which you have kind of gone over, you know, we call it the emotional threshold. So there's like a certain amount of stuff happening that you can take and dissipate and handle. And like you don't need your body to step in or your body doesn't get the message that I need to step in. But the thing is, is when you have like so many different things and you're just like on the edge of going over your emotional threshold, that's when the body's like, okay, she can't, ha basically she can't handle this on her own with her big brain. It's kind of what I, what I like assume my body is doing is like, okay, she, she's over her limit. She just, she can't handle this anymore. She no longer can take this, um, you know, let's say there's a morsel that I'm trying to get this morsel of something, uh, you know, and, I, and she can't handle it anymore. I've got to help her digest it. And so it increases my digestive juices, proliferates digestive tissue, and then I have, you know, digestive problems because I no longer could psychologically handle the circumstance on my own my body got the message that I was over my threshold so it took over and did exactly what it does which is help me get out of this situation now real life 
2018, I'm not, I'm not trying to swallow a bone fragment and my body it doesn't actually need to produce more digestive juices to break down that bone. And so that's where we get these crossed wires. And this is where, you know, medical doctors and people start saying, oh, well, there's something wrong with your body. You're, you know, you've got an autoimmune condition and your body's just going haywire and everything's wrong. That's not the, that's not the case. Your body's doing exactly the right thing. You are just not mindful and aware of the communication of the language of the body what you're communicating to it and how it is responding appropriately when I mean that's the thing is the body always responds appropriately it's we're just not aware of the messages that we're sending and so that's where understanding conflict shocks understanding all of the specifics is really important because you have a whole life ahead of you, a whole bunch of experiences, a whole bunch of potentially conflicting, conflictive type circumstances that could happen. And the more aware you are of these elements, of the stories that you tell yourself, of the, you know, the messages that you're sending and communicating to your body, I mean, you, I feel like you can prevent so many or downgrade or notice it right away um, so that these adaptive periods don't last for a really long time because that's the only time that things are a problem. The only time that your body's gonna do something that's like, mm, maybe we need medicine to step in. Maybe mm -hmm. we need some help here. The only way that that can happen is if you have allowed a conflict, unaware obviously, to go on for an extended period of time. So there's an extended adaptation process. If it's quick, if it's quick, it, you know, you, you will have symptoms, something will happen, but you'll get over it. It won't be a long drawn out, you know, complicated problem. It will be quick because that's what biology has adapted to. That's how, you know, animals in nature, it's always a quick thing. They either get away from the situation, fight or flight. They, they fight and they kill their opponent, they run away from it, or they die. I mean, that's kind of how it goes. And so when you start thinking of yourself as this organism, you start thinking of the challenges in your life is how quickly can I recognize and get over this? Well, what's really interesting about that to me is that chronicity is very much a kind of modern life phenomenon. That there's not really such things as chronic problems pre an agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago. If you go back to like Paleolithic times, or if you go back even further than that, because our biological history is was so much longer even than that, and yet 10,000 years ago things were radically different than they are now. Um, the chronic problems, cr like that's the problem. Rapid resolution really is kind of the secret. What's really interesting about that is that like um, spiritual technologies, Eastern meditation, I mean, Eastern spiritual teaching, whether it's Zen, whether it's Taoism, whether it's like the Hinduism, I mean, it, it, like a lot of the mystical traditions, they're all about basically keeping up with that thing that keeps on going. What being what? Being present. It's about keeping up with that present moment reality, which I think is really interesting if you look at I mean, a lot of Eastern traditions, in my view, were the, the first and a really kind of brilliant effort to address this kind of issue that we have with this overgrown mind that has such a capacity for experience. It's like an echo chamber that like if you whisper something into this echo chamber when someone's three years old, they can be 45 years old, 50, 60 years old, and it's still reverberating in this echo chamber because it's such a powerful place that, that doesn't exist anywhere in nature there's no other animal in the world that has the capacity to relive and to imagine that we do and so a lot of the stuff is about learning how to cope with that learning how to deal with this incredible uh faculty that we have to create realities in our mind to which the physical world including our body begins to respond and I mean, that's a major project. You know, you've got a really powerful uh, thing there. It's like a, you know, a sharp, a dull knife is is not very uh, powerful. It's not it's not particularly dangerous. I can be careless if I'm cutting up. You know, like I cut up kale or something like that. And I get used to cutting up with a dull knife. And I'm you know, I'm going like this. You know, I'm listening to music and all this different stuff. And then we get a new sharp knife, and I've got like there's actually a scar right here. I don't know if you can see it, but um, to prove that like when when it's sharp, you know, what I'm saying when it's powerful, when it has the ability to really do stuff, it's very important that we learn how to yield it. And and so that's. You know, I think of it like this, a lot of the time at the, the low emotional threshold, there's a sense in which our nervous system, which is kind of the, the vehicle for our personal subjective experience, what it's like to be us, our psychological reality. Um, the nervous system is like a signal detection system. So if the body is the house, let's say, the nervous system is in a sense like the security device. It does other stuff too, but one of the things it does is that it acts as a security system. Basically it starts sounding off. You know, it's just like a fight or flight if there's a problem. 
if you do you know like the person who's like home alarms always going off it's like the person whose setting is like so intense that like if a pine needle falls five houses down that like the floodlights come on and the alarm starts going off and everything like that or if there's like a squirrel who crosses the street a mile away like it sets the whole thing off it's like it's too sensitive that's like having a really low emotional threshold is that it, the the freaking out it's not that that is totally maladaptive it's that the criteria for for freaking out is set at such a level that it's causing more problems than it's solving. Actually, it, it, it's creating a tremendous number, amount number of problems. Um, and so then what we need to do is find a way to recalibrate that thing. You know, we need to find a way to make it. So we don't want to rip the security system out. I mean, that's a lobotomy, you know, and that's kind of like a little extreme, right? This is like, oh, I keep getting headaches. And the doctor says, well, we're going to decapitate you and solve the problem. It's like, well, could I keep my head? And also, you know, and, and so really it's about learning to kind of reset that system, recalibrate that system. To get that system is that, you know, in a, it's funny because in a sense we're smart enough, we're clever enough, we're creative enough to get ourselves into trouble. And sometimes we just need a little bit of a push to be creative enough and smart enough to get ourselves out of it. And that, mm -hmm. that's kind of like the nature of software is that you develop this stuff, information, knowledge, we create things, and then we have a new problem. So technology gave rise to cars, and then we ran into a problem. Cars smash into each other and other things, and people die. And so then we started developing technology to cope with that technology. You know what I'm saying? Then we have airbags, and we have, the, oh, look at this. You can smash into, and it'll, you know, it'll re and then eventually, what do we have now? We're going to have self-driving cars. And then, you know, self-driving cars are probably going to crash into stuff, too. Or and then we'll have technology that will solve that and so on and so a lot of what we're doing here with this thought technology is we're finding a way to cope with the fact that our brains are as powerful as they are um, and that they and that it's possible for them to operate in ways that don't necessarily serve us and that because we are in a sense software trying to work on itself it can be a little challenging it can be a little mind bending here are basically some mirrors that we can create. That's what all this stuff is about, like a little mirror. It's amazing, like if you're working on an engine and someone comes and holds a flashlight for you, what a difference that makes. If you're working on a, in a, you know, a dark crevice or something like that, someone else comes and holds a flashlight, all of a sudden you've got two hands and you can do the work and see what you're doing. That's what awareness is all about. That's what our courses are all about. That's what all of this stuff is about. It's about giving you the ability to do work on yourself um, mm -hmm. and, and so you got two hands for you, right? Um, and figuring, figuring that out. And so I think, one of the things in terms of is it necessary to resolve the conflict, for me, I think for a lot of people, anyone usually who asks that question, they ask the question usually because they think what it's going to involve is going and sitting on a couch and t telling someone else about all the bad things that happen or doing mm -hmm. some sort of unpleasant kind of cathartic type work. I don't necessarily, it, it can be useful if it triggers awareness, you know. I don't think, though, that's the most effective means of developing awareness. I think that's a fixation on content. If we can instead look at how is your personal history influencing what you're thinking, how you're feeling, what you're doing here and now, because to the degree that what happened in your past is relevant to your present reality, um, it has to be operating or influencing what you're doing in your present reality. And, and it's possible to delve into all the past stuff without seeing how it's affecting us here and now. On the other hand, it's possible to see how it's affecting us here and now, if it is, without delving into all the past stuff. And so my preference is just to watch here and now with awareness. And you don't even have to be watching for ways in which this, whatever, this, this personal stuff that happened, the conflict or whatever, you don't even have to say, oh, I'm looking for evidence of a conflict. You just say, what's happening? What am I thinking? What's going on with me here and now? Because what will happen is, is that you'll start to see what's going on. If some of what you see isn't serving you, your awareness of that over time, it, it takes some time for this, to, for this to work because it takes some time for a true awareness to kick in, will cause it to fall away. Mm -hmm. And so rather than going into the past and trying to find out, why not in speculating, because a lot of it ends up being pretty speculative, what we end up doing is just watching what's the reality of what's happening right now. Not in, in, the, in the history or in theory or whatever, but in my experiential reality. I'm anxious all the time. I'm focusing on what I don't want a bunch. I'm feeling unworthy a large part of the time. I'm feeling really angry a lot. Watch and find out how you do that. Because it's how you're doing. Like, it's not that a conflict happened. And, and, and the conflict happened at this point in time. And then the, 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 the adaptation, the disease process, the biological program is emanating from it. If there's something going on now there's conflict happening now. You know what I'm saying? Conflict exists to be observed here and now. Conflicting is happening now, if it's happening. Because it, conflict, I mean, nothing happens in the past. Things always happen here and now, if they're happening. And so if you watch here and now, you'll find out a lot of really relevant stuff. And resolution kind of, 
occurs. It kind of just happens. It's sort of, I mean, that's how it happens is that you see, oh, this is coming from me. It's coming from how I'm relating to this thing. It's coming from what I'm thinking about here. Um, you notice things aren't serving you. It becomes increasingly difficult, eventually impossible to continue to do those things. It changes fundamentally your experience because insight doesn't necessarily change your experience, but awareness does. And it's the experience that your body is responding to. Your body isn't necessarily responding to, you know, um, the fact that you don't remember everything that happened. It's responding to an experience that's happened here and now. Mm -hmm. And if that experience changes, the communication changes, the body's responses to it change. And it's really, and that's like all of the, every journaling exercise in the Resolve program, they're all kind of designed around that. It's actually really cool because, you know, your conflicts, really you can use them you can utilize them to develop this kind of conscious awareness and so when you learn about the things that have happened to you and how that has influenced how you are thinking feeling be believing behaving now you can basically just use them because they're kind of like hot topics you can look at them and see how they are active in your life currently. And so that's the really important thing. It's not the content of the conflict. You can just simply use that to say, oh, you know what, when this happened to me, I can see how I told myself, I'm, you know, like this, this teacher rejected me or my, you know, my parents wouldn't ever give me positive feedback on my homework or something. And so, you know, I kind of perpetually, you know, my, my family's really smart. I've always told myself that I'm stupid. So that situation that happened, you know, maybe it was, the time your your dad ignored you and, and didn't give you the kind of pat on the back that you were expecting to get um, over this project or something, that could have been the moment. But what that did, what that moment did for you was set up a, a belief, uh, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, and that set up a pattern of thinking that you're still engaging in. And so you can you can do the digging, you can do, you know, like the look back in the past and see what it was. And again, there's use in that, only in as much as you can see, oh, I now can see how that situation set up this this thought pattern, this belief, this consciousness, this you know, this way I was conscious of being that is influencing me and in all of my interactions here today. And that's why I've had chronic neck pain forever. That's why I've got, you know, degenerated spine. It's because I've been beating myself up for not being smart enough for 30 years. You know what I mean? And so it's useful. Just you can utilize all of it. That's the coolest thing is that there is nothing that's happened to you that you cannot use to learn about yourself and create a better future moving forward. That's all it's about is the more that you can learn. And that's the benefit of understanding the conflict shocks and the kind of the, the nuances of all of it is so that you can understand yourself better. And when you understand yourself and you have that awareness, you can create more of what you want in your experience. When, I think that's a critical thing too. Knowledge and is nothing but potential experience. Understanding is nothing but potential experience. That's it. It's, it's this, I mean, it's only useful in as much as it can be used to facilitate desirable changes in experience and what it's like to be you. We'll talk about that. What does that mean? To what extent does an understanding of physics or of chemistry matter? To what extent is it useful? Well, to the extent that it can be used for practical purposes. What are practical purposes? Well, we can use it to do this. And we can use it to do that. Okay, what's the point of making that lotion? What's the point of making that television? What's the point of making that car, that spaceship? Well, the point you know to which it can increase the quality or the well-being of conscious creatures. The point to which it can create changes and shifts in experience. What's the use of knowledge of GNM? Well, it's useful in as much as it can create within you a, a shift in your experience. That's what the Ever Better stuff is all about. That's what everything is it's about. Creating a transformation of your experience. And so I come back to this whole idea, what if I'm at peace with it? Are you at peace with doing things in ways that don't serve you? Because that's possible. It's possible mm. to resign ourselves to things that can be changed. It, it's possible to cope with things that can be changed. And coping with stuff makes sense if you're under the impression that you can't change it. You know what I'm saying? But when you recognize you can change these things in your experience, then coping becomes kind of an antiquated approach to things. It, you know, it, 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 it becomes obsolete. And that's really, for me, coping has become obsolete because I have kind of discovered that I have such an incredible capacity. Human beings have such an incredible capacity to not just modify their experience, not just change their mood, but to literally transform their experience so that it is completely unrecognizable. Then, you know, is a little bit of a different kind of thing. And that's, that's why I like our approach to this stuff. I mean, I, I guess I would, right? But I like the fact that what we're talking about here, like GNM is a starting point. 
Um, it's a map, it's a model. I mean, basically, it's a, it's a model for connecting physical symptoms to specific uh, psychological conflicts, basically. By, you know, like, what does this mean, psychological? Well, I never I thought, my neck hurts. Okay, well, that suggests something about an intellectual self-devaluation. That, you know, kind of points you in that direction. After that, though, we jump off and we start looking at what does intellectual self-devaluation look like for you? I mean, what, in terms of thoughts, in terms of feelings, in terms of meaning assignment, in terms of what you're paying attention to, what you're believing, what you're noticing, what, you know what I'm saying? in terms of all those things, it becomes a very practical kind of thing. Um, and when you, it's interesting, when you, because I came to this whole thing from a perspective of, of wanting to improve what it was like to be me in the most big picture general kind of way. And so as soon as you told me about all this stuff, I was like, oh, that sounds like that could be interesting. That sounds like that's an offshoot of improving what it's like to be people, you know? Um, it, it's, a, it's a door into this awareness. It's a door into this transformation of consciousness. It's a door into all of those things. Um, I don't blame you if you don't want to look back and I don't want to talk about my stepmom and my relationship to my dad and what it would have been like if my dad gave me more hugs and my stepmom were less neurotic and blah. I mean, I don't, you know, like that doesn't interest me. What does interest me though is improving what it's like to be me right here and right now. And I, what, what happens is I spend very little time thinking about my past and my childhood and all that. But what's interesting is that when I observe things, and I'll tell you about this stuff sometimes, I'll be watching myself, what I'm doing here and now, I'll be on a quest to improve what it's like to be me, and I'll notice something. Procrastination, grumpiness, uh, hostility towards other people, maybe cynicism or something like that. And I'll say, you know, really interesting. I just noticed something that I was doing right here and right now, and it reminded me of something that used to go on when I was younger. It reminded mm. me of something I used to see a bunch that's interesting. Gosh, is that what it looks like for me to be playing out that script that I learned, that I was given, that I was kind of programmed with? That, that's how it's useful. This, you, I'm not a big fan of digging into the past. I like to dig into the present. Because if you dig into the present, what normally, and what that means basically is watching and being aware. If, if you dig into the present, if there is relevant stuff in the past, that stuff emerges. It reveals itself. We don't have to play archaeology. We don't have to play, okay, we're going to go, we're going to dig something up and we better find something because, you know, this whole process is predicated on us finding something here. You know, we're looking at all these closets. I want to see at least one skeleton. It, it, that kind of creates this sort of like retroactive, and I think it's a very healthy thing for you to, to not be, so, to, to say, do I really need to do that? You know what I mean? I really think if we watch the present moment closely enough, Everything about the past that we need to understand, that we need to know about, that we need to be aware of, it will reveal itself to us because the past cannot enter our experience except by the doorway of the present moment. My, if something awful happened to me when I was four or five or six years old, whatever that thing is cannot touch me without entering into the now, entering into my experience through the gateway of now, through the gateway of what's happening in terms of thought, feeling, behavior, right? A memory is just the thought. I mean, it's a replaying of a tape, right? And if I'm watching my now moment, my now present reality, and I start playing an old tape, it may be an old tape from 20 years ago, but I'm playing it now in my mind. And if I observe that, I say, whoa, Man, when I play that tape here and now, I'm creating an experience for myself that I really don't like. Now, does that mean that you just stop it? Well, it might take a little bit of doing. It might take some practice to figure out how to avoid playing that tape. And usually what that practice involves is becoming specifically, I mean, becoming acutely aware of what gets that tape going? What gets that tape playing? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because there, there are thoughts that I think that kind of cue that up without my realizing it. There are things that I do. It's like we, we just got Roku and you know it's got a new remote. It's actually pretty user friendly, but there are certain buttons that you push to get certain responses. And I'm figuring out, I'm still in the process of figuring out, oh, when I push that button, I get this response. We do this in consciousness. We do this mentally. It's like you've got this new remote. You're trying to figure out how to use it. And it's like, oh, wait, I didn't want to watch this. I didn't want to watch this old tape. We were thinking thoughts. We were pushing, but it's automated things, right? We were getting a response that we, that we didn't want because we didn't realize kind of what we were doing. Awareness brings that to the fore. It makes it perfectly clear. It takes all of this from being a, con a concept, an idea that some guy is talking to you about on Facebook. I mean, who ca you know, like who is, who am I? Who cares what I have to say? And it turns it into a personal experience for you. It, mm. it, you discover things for yourself. You know what I'm saying? That is when it becomes really interesting because you can't believe this stuff enough for it to create any change in your life. You have to experience it. And the only way to experience it is to go play with it, to go try it on, to go watch and see, to observe. The only way to do it right is to do it wrong a whole bunch. 
That's I think that's one of those things too is like being really comfortable feeling like you're not doing anything or feeling like you're doing something wrong and and you just kind of keep tinkering with it. That's how you discover really great things. Because mm-hmm. if you if 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 I gave you a list of things to do and you went and did them all perfectly, you'd never discover anything new because you wouldn't discover anything I hadn't already discovered, right? When you do things wrong, Maybe you do them wrong a million times. On the one millionth and one and first time that you do it wrong, you discover something completely different. You see what you needed to see all along, and it makes the whole thing worthwhile. Yeah. And so I think, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a really good question. Um, and I think it says something about, I, I, I kind of get a feel for the person who asked the question, and I get the sense that you've got a healthy aversion to hanging out in the past. I think also uh, there's a lot of things we can do here and now that'll create really great, really great, like deep resolution for you. And one of my favorite things about resolving this stuff is that like, if, if I, if I had to spend my time resolving individual conflicts with people and I couldn't equip them to deal with all conflicts, I couldn't really help them kind of conflict proof themselves or at least make it so that they could resolve a conflict really rapidly. Ones that haven't even happened yet. I'd get very depressed. I, I would not find that fulfilling because it's like, I mean, there's one, how many people are there in the world? Seven plus a billion, and how many conflicts per person? Per, and it's kind of like, I feel like, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. But if what I could do is help you to install within yourself uh, a capacity to kind of respond resourcefully to everything that happens, if we can use your personal history, like you said, and we can say, ooh, what a juicy opportunity to learn how to respond resourcefully to some tough stuff. What a great opportunity to realize how powerful you are. We're at a really sweet opportunity to wake up to your abilities to really kind of be a wizard. Or what's a what's a, a lady wizard? Um, is, it, is it also sorceress? A wizard? I sorceress. Don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, that yeah, sorcerer wizard. Is there a wiz- is there a female wizard? Is it just another wizard? Is a witch and a warlock? Is a sorcerer and a I sorceress? Think I think it's also a wizard. Just a wizard, right? Yeah. Whatever you know, to really unravel your experience. We're about to watch all the Harry Potter movies, so we'll come back and update that if it if it needs to change. Do you think it'll be in there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know, to really discover your capacity to consciously create your experience, to do weird stuff. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. I ever mm. knew I could. Remember when you were a kid and somebody would show you something? It was just the coolest thing ever. It was like a, a magic trick, or they'd show you. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I remember I went to a. a, a it was like it was a. Kind of funny because I was about nine or ten or eleven, or so I was somewhere in there. It was like that, like you're a kid, but you're kind of getting into teenage years. And there was this really cool arcade place, and you you might remember the name of this place um, because I think we've talked about it before. It had arcades and it had this big bouncy house zone. It was a, it was the coolest bouncy house, like big. It was like a big well, like, like discovery a, zone. It wasn't discovery zone, but it was maybe something. It actually might have been. There was a big like um, Aztec kind of pyramid. And there were these palm trees and all this, and it was like all soft. And so you could jump all over the place and climb all over the place, all this different stuff. And there was a guy who was in charge of this place. And he was a Chinese guy. And he was like, I mean, he, he was from China. And he was the coolest guy ever. I mean, he literally looked like he was from like a Jackie Chan movie. And he showed us all sorts of, I didn't even know what this martial art was. Because I learned ta- Taekwondo. And it, we didn't do any of this kind of cool stuff. That he would show us these like wrist locks. And you could like flip people over and stuff. And so we were flipping each other over. And it was the coolest thing. I had no idea you could do that. People I'd learned from before, even martial arts, had no idea that you could do stuff like that. And he showed us this and just worked like magic. And that's what a lot of our stuff is like with the mind and with experience and all of this. Is it's like, oh, I had no idea, you know, that we could do that. Now, the unfortunate thing was the next time I came back, I was too big to go on the play zone. And the guy wasn't there anymore. And it was kind of like that was the most fun I'd ever had in my life up until that point. Um, and I wanted <laughs> so bad to get back in this place and practice this little this little maneuver. Um, Kim says she loves your childhood stories. So. Okay. <laughs> They're good. Thanks. Um, it, it applies, you know. Yeah. I remember I got so fascinated with this when I figured out, and we just kept we wanted to do it over and over again because it was almost like I I couldn't believe it was going to work again. It was there was a part of me that was like, oh, this has got to be too good to be true. It can't. You can't literally like I'm not. I was there was no physical effort either. It was like, and I took this. I don't even know what it was to this day, but something you'd grab and and and, and like you would just go like this, and the person would go flying, and it, they would. And it we're was gonna, the coolest thing. Now we're going to practice this. We'll yeah, I hope, well, maybe this guy will see the video and will contact me. Send me a oh message because I, I want to <laughs> learn this thing again. Um, but you can do this with your experience. And we've mm-hmm. done this, right? You're feeling some way you don't want to feel. And you try it and you get it right. And it's like you flip out of it. It's mm-hmm. like you pull a thread on a sweater. You know, this, and like, like your favorite sweater, there's always a thread. And it's so easy to find. And you pull it and the whole thing just like falls apart in front of you. It's like it vanishes like it never existed. These negative experiences, you can be that way too. You find these little threads and you learn to, to pull them. And the whole experience transforms. And then you think, oh my God, 
that's fucking amazing. That's incredible. Mm. How, what? And you almost want to do it again and again and again. And so it's kind of cool. You start out with, geez, you know, my neck is really hurting. Gosh, I've got this diagnosis. Ooh, I really want to figure this thing out. I want to resolve this. And in the process of doing it, this mm. is how contrast gives rise to really amazing things. I had a problem. And, and, and at, at first, all I wanted to do was solve that problem. I, I, I'm not interested in, I'm not even focused. I am so behind. My kids are doing this and my job and I've got credit card bills and blah, blah, blah. I can't even think about creating the life that I want. I just want to get out of pain so I can show up to my job I don't like very much so they can make ends meet. You know what I mean? But what's interesting is, like Einstein says, is that you cannot solve a problem at the level that the problem is created or experienced. You go up a level, and you discover all sorts of cool stuff when you're up there. Mm -hmm. You discover all sorts of cool stuff when you're up there. And then it, it gets weird because you almost start saying to yourself, man, I'm almost not mad that those things happen to me anymore. I almost don't wish that that stuff were different than it was. And, and that is such a powerful place for you to be because it's a place of complete non-resistance. And it's a place of complete kind of loving and also vigorous and determined engagement mm -hmm. with your present reality where you're looking at what is and you don't see what is, you see the outline of what can be. That's all it is. is it, you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know those things, like you look at like, a, is it a profile or is it like a lady or a skeleton? You know those like weird yeah. drawings? It's like that. When you're looking at your reality, are you sure that it's what is or is it what can be? Like if you can shift your focus, if you can kind of cross your mental eyes, if you can kind of just like loosen up a little bit and break out of this pattern that the world has put you into in terms of seeing this thing and relating to this thing, what if you got wacky with it? What if you got weird with it? What if you got crazy with it? You know what I mean? What would happen then? Because mm -hmm. people don't get crazy and creative and wacky and artistic when they're in life and death situations, when you're in fight or flight mode, when you're in danger, you don't tend to think outside the box. You think very much in the box. And as you begin to think outside the box, the experience, the communication to your body starts to change. And you start tapping into all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, yeah. we, we talk about some out there stuff. And it didn't start that way. I mean, it start, I mean, remember, like, remember how like boring I was like when we first did the Everbird Life course and I was like very much the pattern, the pattern, the pattern. I wouldn't talk about anything else. But it's like you play with this stuff long enough and you start discovering really interesting things about yourself. And you transcend your problems. Yeah. And the solution to the problem isn't solving it. It's transcending it. Discovering mm -hmm. other really amazing things. And so, yeah, don't bother looking in the past. All the action's here and now. The magic is here. The, you know, the solutions are here. Um, and also, you know, the problems are here, too. The, and the problem is the invitation, really, to find the solution. Um, yeah, it's all here. Yes, it is. And we hope that that answered your question. Please feel free to follow up. Um, we love the questions. So keep asking questions for us to answer in video format because just such good stuff comes out of it. Um, for those of you who want to check out Resolve, please do. That is kind of where we pour so much of these ideas into very specific um, videos on very specific conflicts so that you can you can deepen your understanding of how this whole thing works of you know what are some ways to you know transcend, transmute the feeling of abandonment or isolation or you know, moral, intellectual self-devaluation. And so we show you some mental maneuvers. We equip you with these tools so that you can start looking, you can use whatever kind of problem it is that you have as a lever to, to dig deeper into your own experience using the, the journals and the, the notes and the videos, just kind of like deepening your understanding so you can find that you become a ninja, a wizard, a person who, there's no situation, there's, you can't, there's no corner you can be backed into. You have mental maneuvers, you have mental flexibility, your emotional threshold is elevated so that things don't bother you. And if things do bother you, you recognize it, you resolve it right away. And that's pretty much the best that an organism can hope for because you don't live in a plastic bubble. You live in the world. You live where there's experience and there's stuff happening and shocking things catch you off guard. And so how do you become anti-fragile is you, you work on your flexibility. You work on your responses. You work on your inner dialogue and what you tell yourself all day long and the things you're actively believing about yourself, the world, and other people. And so that program, it helps you to do that. There's so, so, so much good stuff in there. Um, if you use the code YouTube, you get $5 off your membership. And then also, there's some really, really cool things happening in the GNM community in the United States. And so, you know, pretty soon here, GNM is going to be huge. And we're going to need more practitioners and people who are equipped and who know how to help people, help teach people 
these principles. And so that's what the uh, Resolve Inner Circle is all about, is showing you, you know, are you a health coach? Do you want to be a health coach? Do you think, hmm, I could I could do that. I'm working on my own problems. I'm getting through my own issues. I think I can help people in this in this regard. Pretty soon, a lot of people are going to be like knocking down your door for, for consults and, and sessions with someone who knows how to take them through this process. And so that's what we're building in the uh, inner circle as a community of people who are equipped and can help people work through resolving conflicts and you know giving people these tools. So if that's for you, check it out as well. I would say too, even if you even if you don't think that you're necessarily interested in working with other people, I personally want like a like a practitioner's level of understanding of myself, because um, I think that this really is stuff for all people, and that is one yeah. of the things for Ever Better that was is like if you what what better thing to be an expert in than yourself, or mm -hmm. what better thing to be an expert in than a system for really kind of like deliberately taking control of this subjective experience that you're having. I mean, why shouldn't you be having an experience of living that you like and that's custom designed and built by you? And that's like one of those things. I mean, you can you can go and you can do, you can buy somebody else's software. You can read somebody else's book. You can buy into someone else's philosophy. You can take somebody else's therapy. Um, but you never have the level of creative control of a programmer. Because what a programmer does is they design their own stuff. And mm -hmm. that's the thing, when you become sort of a programmer of yourself, I mean, when, and when you, and that's what really the course is about, it's about these patterns that you take and that it gives you just this level of creative control. I mean, you know, it's one thing to, to be assembling Legos, you know, and it's like, okay, well, they gave me a Lego that was three long and two deep, and they gave me a Lego that was two long and two deep, and they gave me a Lego that was too long and one deep, and so I can pretty much assemble these different things. And I think that for a lot of people is how life is, is that you've got these precast chunks and you do your best to build your castle. You know, it's like, when I, but you know, it's like you couldn't, like the classic Legos, you couldn't build a convincing castle on that. They weren't the right color, they weren't the right shape, but all this different stuff. This is a way to basically cast your own pieces and then put them together. And that's cool, that's a different level because then you can put together, they got like Star Wars Legos now, like, you know, what are they, Harry, Harry Potter, Potter Legos? <laughs> I used to have like, oh, here's a square, here's a rectangle, here's a flat piece, and it was like, here, have fun. Um, but now they have all these different things. And that's how I feel in my experience now. It's like when I walk down the aisle at Target or I walk by the, Lord help, the Lego store uh, in the mall. I mean, I have such a hard time, not one, acting like a complete weirdo, and two, spending five or six or seven thousand dollars because Legos are expensive. Um, you have such a degree of control. You're not confined to other people's pieces anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, I can do it this way. I can do it that way. Oh, that's really neat. Oh, this is, it's freedom from the constraints of a kind of pre-created reality. I feel like there is this kind of like mass produced experience that's out there. Totally. And, and when you learn to kind of transcend that, it's just really cool. Mm -hmm. And everything really started changing for me when I was like, you ever had a dream where your feet were like stuck in sand or you basically things were going terribly wrong <laughs> and there was nothing you could do about it. You know what I'm talking about? Like those, and like how did, and then I started asking myself, I started wondering, how do you know you're not doing that now? So how do you know that you're not right now in sort of a dream where you're not able to do the things, um, you're not really able to solve these problems, that there's all these awful things going on and you're powerless to do anything about them. You can't even, you can't, that's like kind of like the, the ultimate nightmare is that disempowerment. There's something big and scary after you and you can't run away from it. You know what I'm saying? And you can't do anything about it. Have you ever woken up in a dream? like done lucid dreaming. It's very cool because then all of a sudden you have all of this power. And that for me is what a lot of this stuff is about. It's about like we're dreaming and this is about learning to lucid dream. It's about learning to wake up and realize that you really can do anything that you want. There's just these... There's, there's just this this like kind of like inner shift that has to happen, and it's an unseen shift, and it's not something that you can go and someone says da 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 da, and then you've got it because it's not behavioral. It's a consciousness thing. It's a it's a it's an inner movement of consciousness. It's stuff that's going on behind your eyeballs, and therefore it's kind of difficult to see because the eyes look out this way; they don't look back, you know. And this is about learning kind of to look back. It's about seeing what's going on within with the clarity um, with which we see what's going on without. And so, yeah, it's cool stuff. Yes, it is. Have a great night. We think you're awesome, and we'll see you again soon. Good night.